Hey, we are New Friday. You Ray, you're muted. <laughs> yeah, I cannot hear you, Ray. Oh, I heard chipmunk. What is that? <laughs> Feedback. We need the chipmunk filter on. <laughs> Someone has a helium leak in their house. Ray, you're still... I think that might be you. I think it's him, yeah. Um, unfortunately, we can't understand you. It's, it's kind of crazy. <clears throat> I've, never, yeah, I've never heard that <laughs> before. Guy, can you say something? Can you say something, guy? Let me see if you... Uh, Isaiah says, uh, uh, you've had a haircut. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I did. <laughs> I was telling Joe and Thomas the other day that I got angry. You know, like women do, like they 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 get angry at a guy and they just cut their head off. Like I, I just got angry. And I just... uh, uh, in my case, they slam doors. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So it seems to me that the problem was with Ray. Uh, yeah, so it seems to me that probably restarting. audio, right? Audio has some issues, but in the meantime, if there, anybody else has a, a question mm -hmm. or something, we can go ahead and start off with that. Um, um, I've got a real quick one. Um, I've got office hours. I've got a couple of questions for office hours, but these are really quick ones. Um, can I go ahead? Yeah, go ahead. Let's go ahead and okay. start with that. When you write a GUI, you start off with, let's say, new, and you end up with show. Um, and then you have buttons that go to subroutines, that go subs to subroutines, aren't they? Can you? Just give me the logic of the thread of where the thread is, where what's it executing or where is it waiting or what's going on with that. Okay, so whenever you click a button, it launches a new thread. And that thread has specific information and context regarding that button. For mm -hmm. example, a GUI will contain the name of the GUI that has that button. A GUI control would have the H, the handle of the button that actually launched the thread. Okay. So you, uh, as uh, AutoHotKey is single threaded, that means that whenever you click one button, all the context is for that one button. You cannot access context from another uh, from another button uh, just by checking on those global variables because there are some okay. global variables that the only information they have is the ones on that context. Let me go ahead and do something real quick. Okay. That's on the documentation so that I could mention it when I go ahead and talk about the fields in variables specifically. And here. So let me share my screen real quick. Not sure if you can see my screen right now. Oh, the, uh, are they global variables? I'm familiar with them. Right. So, so what happens is there's a group of them, these guys here, GUI mm -hmm. windows and menu bars. Mm -hmm. Some of them, like a GUI or a GUI control, GUI width and height, all of these variables yeah. right here, mm -hmm. they're all of them are uh, are related to the current threat. Okay. So whenever you click a button, the thread will have information about that particular thread. And all these variables that I'm just talking about are related to that. If you want information about other windows and other controls, you would have to get the information with GUI control get or with GUI Yeah, submit. I understand that. Like okay, that so is that, does that also apply to non auto hotkey controls? So if I click on a third party window, mm -hmm. would the window height and width be available to me? No. So uh, those okay. are different things because the events for those third party controls are not handled by AutoHotKey in the same way. So you would have okay. to get just, the information just, just hoping some, Yeah, okay. So um, this doesn't this doesn't answer my question directly. It helps. It puts a context in. Mm -hmm. So if you could pop up a word a notepad window and just um, um, display uh, uh, just a normal uh, GUI, uh, you know, write a normal GUI, um, right. you know. What would I do with the GUI? Because that's the thing. So right now, and this is what you have to kind of like uh, contextualize. This is also a window. So let's talk about windows, not GUIs. Yes. Because GUIs is just a general term for um, 
talking interfaces. No, no, no. Okay. For interfaces in okay. general. So because let me interface is created with many windows. So this thing is a collection of windows that yes. AutoHotKey does not have control over. Correct. Right. So now, let's write a bit of script that is really, really basic that just, just displays a GUI. Uh, a GUI. Okay. Right, so we add edit, and we have a 100 GUI show. Yeah. Okay. Return. Now here, when I'm okay. running this, I have my GUI, and now these two uh, GUIs, those two are a collection of windows. Yep. The ones on this right side, I have full access to them, and any button that I have or any control that I have, I could confirm some global variables like a GUI width and a GUI height because they are inside the AutoHotKey script. Now, anything from this control, uh, from this window, I cannot do it that way. I would have to get the okay. information. Uh, okay, this is good to know, but not where I was going for. Okay. So if you put uh, a label, a line one, just put a label in there saying, um, make, um, make my GUI or something. Just put, yeah. give it a normal label. Just get rid of that. No, no. As I'm saying, is just put it in a, in a put it in, in a variable a, in a routine. No, no. Just put it in a normal um, subroutine. You know, put a label in there saying uh, make my GUI, um, and then call that there during during your script. You're going to call that that label, routine. Okay. that routine. That's, so go sub test, and yep. my test is going to have. Uh, what, line variable? two and three, line two, three, and four are going to be in your test. Okay, so these guys are going to be here. So that means okay. that I just start and launch, and it goes with this, right? Okay, so there could be other code running or whatever, right, and whatever. the code goes and fires up and, and shows off that GUI. Now, yes. put a button on that GUI. Okay. With a ghost, with a with a G label to go to. Right. And then place that G label after line nine, the return. And, you know, that's it. You got it there. Okay, now we've got a basic setup here that we can discuss how things go. So um, my script is running above, and when it needs to, it calls test. Is it right. go sub or go to, first of all? No, go sub is better. Go to okay. uh, they do the same thing, but okay. uh, right. go That's... sub. Let me let me just clarify this for people who are new. Difference is, go sub finishes the subroutine and continues running whatever is below. So you would have it was fast where it started. Yeah. Okay. So if you have that, it would go run whatever is there and continue with this line. Okay. If you use a go to, that doesn't happen. It goes to the subroutine and stays over there. Okay, so, I mean, let, you can put a message box here and saying all done or whatever, you know. Yeah, whatever. But, yeah. So, okay. Okay, so you've called your subroutine. It shows And the window comes up, mm -hmm. okay. What is it doing now? Where is it? What is it? You know, if, if I put, uh, if I want it to um, do something else, if I wanted to, you know, so if you... If you uh, run that now, save um, let me let me and this is, this is something that it is a little bit easier if I show it in code. Okay, I could go line by line and I could just show you what it's doing, right? Okay, so let's just go ahead and, and do a new file. So run to a new file now, it's gonna be out of our key, uh, save it as a test, and I'm gonna just stop right here. Can when you I make run, it can make the text bigger because yes. Okay, That's so, better. Right. So if I do this, I press F9. Uh, hold on and see. Okay. Because I need to have it like this. Um, if I press that, I just stop. So my script is running and it's just stopped in the first line. Okay. Go sub is when I hit the next step, it's just going to jump to this line. So let me do it as a line. Let me do it like this. It would jump to the routine called test, right? Correct. See? It just jumped there. That, that's so just... far so good. Right. So, so now it's going to go ahead and add the buttons, show the GUI. You see that it showed it. Yeah. Return, and the return is going to come back up to where it says message box done. Okay. And I just do that. So I save okay. that. Okay, fine. Now, when I hit, when I hit 
my button test here. So let's go ahead and hit the button test. When I hit test, it would jump to the subroutine that says test right there, but it will jump with a context. And that's where a GUI will have some information, a control is going to have some information, a event people, and all of that. We're going to have some information okay, so, set up there. So let me ask you another question. When you right. hit when you hit the run button uh, without the, the stopping, just hit the run. The GUI will right. show. Right. The GUI. Uh, so hold on. I mean, let me stop it first, and then just... right. So it's just going to show done, and nothing else is going to happen. So this section of the code never gets executed unless you press on the button. It but it showed it showed done straight away. It didn't. Right. It it, it didn't. That, that's what I I didn't understand. I thought it hung around until I hit uh, destroy GUI. No, 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 no. Remember, as I just mentioned a few minutes ago, whenever you do a subroutine like this, a go sub, yep. it goes ahead, runs whatever is here, and then it comes back and continues executing whatever is down there. Okay. So that's what happens with subroutines <clears throat> or functions. If I had it as a function instead of a subroutine, it, it will... Stop. It would just run. No, it would not stop. It would actually just go ahead. So if I had it as a as a function like this, I don't know if this makes more sense to you. I yeah, okay. call the function, and then a message box is shown, right? Yeah. It's not if I if I run a function, it's not going to stop there. It's no. going to continue to the next line, right? Okay. It's the same with a subroutine. If you use go sub, it's the same as calling a function. Well, I think okay. the, I think what the confusion is is uh, you know you're saying one thread. So if the GUI is still open. Why is the thread able to still continue even though the GUI is oh, still right. there? Okay, that's yeah. Yeah, I, I that's think that's right. the way. Thank you for yeah. Thank you for putting it into language. That, that is that is that is a very good question. And yeah, now, it took me a second to get that, it too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What you have to understand is that the auto execute section in here is one big thread. Now, every time you go into a super team, a new thread is launched, and when it returns it comes back to the main thread, which is the auto-execute section. Okay, so think about it like you have the main super, uh, the main routine that is going to be calling other subroutines, and once you enter into a subroutine, when it finishes, it goes back to the main routine, unless it has finished. Now, just and this is why the return word here is very important yes. because I tell you when that main routine finishes. If I put the return before the message box, you will never get the message box because I no, told no. it like finish that thread, right? So, so it it is a very interesting question. But so whenever you have those subs and functions, it creates a new routine. It finishes and then goes back to the auto execute section and continues uh, from there until it finishes. My my um, perception was. Uh, distorted by the fact that I'm thinking the window is still on display. It must be doing something. It hasn't come back yet. Right. It, no, no, okay. no, it's not okay. like that. No. Okay. Right, right. right. Okay. This is where, with Isaiah showing how to use the debugging tools and stepping through and watching right. where you are, like it really helps you understand. Right. Uh, uh, Absolutely. You, and you can definitely see exactly the point where the script enters those the things that it has to do. When it finishes with the return, it actually continues up there. You know yeah. how it jumped up yep, again? Yep. You can definitely see what it's doing um, when you use the stepping tools, just to go ahead and see exactly what the script is actually awesome. uh, doing. Yeah. Tyler had, had chatted about just you know testing your script as you're going, and I was just commenting, hey, you know, this whole thing about debugging, like the whole life in programming is debugging, right? And yes. testing. Mainly. Mm -hmm. Being able to isolate exactly what it is, like you're trying to test, this is where tools that have built in debuggers, like because Cypher, oh, AutoHotKey, oh. HK Studio, VS Code, there's still a ton of others, right? Uh, have built in debugging processes where you can do this, and it's so much better than a message box. Right, yeah. Um, Later on, I will show you one, one of, of the of issues that we were having um, in one of our scripts and how debugging was just uh, having a step uh, part that would allow me to step through it mm -hmm. um, helps Ray. But let me see if Ray was able to actually fix his audio issues and see if he has a question because it looked like he had something or to say. Else. Yeah. yeah. 
A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Hey, hey. Go. No chipmunk <laughs> anymore. <laughs> Thank you, Isaiah. <Josh. laughs> You're welcome. So, Ray, how I can help you today? Um, okay, I have some pretty basic questions. I'm a basic um, starting guy. Uh, how can I show you my screen? Um, there is a button in Zoom uh, where, where you can see oh, okay. all the... Yeah, it's uh, yes, the yes. Oh, okay. Here, right? Okay, I understand. Okay, now I'm... Okay, there. And let... Uh, okay, yeah, this like the, screen. The, the screen, yes. This screen and then there. Okay, now. First thing. I press a button and instead of and I get notepad instead of um, uh, SCI etc. Okay, so the, instead of Scintilla, so whenever you you open a file, it actually opens with notepad. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, and it used to. It we'll used to an edit open. script. It used to open. To, so that's because you have to set your default editor to um, the one that you want. Now, what you could do, if you go to one of the uh, um, Auto Hotkey scripts uh, files oh, into the Explorer. So go, just go to File Explorer and find one Auto Hotkey file, whatever. Um, so, I think it would be easier uh, if, if, I, if I gave you control. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. Right. Okay, there. So now, yeah. if I go to, do you have kind of like an explode for the matter? Just open a, a folder that has out of hotkey screen. Yes, I can do that. Um, here and here. And okay. this yeah. is the one. Yeah, it, it could be any, because what I want to do is click here where it says, no, just click where it says open with. So let's go ahead and do this. Let me just a second. Okay. So I'll right right click and... Look and the URL over my head, you'll see a, a, a script you can download that makes it really easy to swap your default editor. All right. Oh, yeah, let's do that, actually. Um, so um, if you can go to that, what, let's go to that website. That's going to be the... Okay, so if you can go to that website, let's open up. Uh, yeah. If you can go to edit um, the automator, we go. So this one actually changes the editor for you because if I if I do it in a different way, can you just add the information and then download that? Yeah, let's tell everyone your email address. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So after download, just open the script. Yeah. Now what did I do? Okay, there. Oh. Go and file manager. Okay. I have a backup thing going on, right? Yeah. I, so, oh. so, yeah, if you can grab that script, put it out, um, I think you can put it out in downloads or something. Um, you you have it. Um, no, so that, that, that's... Um, and you have to search, where's the search again? Not, not out of, but page to page. Ah, here we go. So let's go from that. So add a new one. So just go ahead and look for your editor, whatever it is. Um, okay, so my The one that you want to use? Yeah, I'll get it in a second. Okay. Uh, here. Perfect. No. Uh, here. Here. This one. This is just the grab one. the path of it and you copy the path. Uh, there. Okay. 
here, here, open that. New editor, save prick. Click OK, and let's just go ahead and verify something. Um, Okay, so I want to set the system. Now, um, let's go ahead and try again by clicking the edit. System. Okay, it did it. There you go. Yeah. So, oh. so we, we, we actually created that little tool because of that, because there's a lot of times that the editor gets reset or something. Um, and, and Or you want to try a new one and, and you want to swap back and forth. And Right, uh, so that, that little tool allows you to kind of, it, it keeps track of the select editors that you have added and so on, and yeah, it's a good. Um, now, I have another question, if I might. Um, I, uh, okay, I'll, yeah, okay. okay, so I run this script, and I get this message, and it's it tells me this line will never ex execute, execute to return. Because, right, so... Here's the thing, and this is what I was just explaining a few minutes ago. Um, the return keyword tells Aroha Key where that script is going to stop reading in that thread. So if you open the script, please, let's go ahead and edit it, right? Let's go ahead and edit it. And let's go to that line. It actually tells you, do you know the, oh, I think it is. Uh, try to run it again. Yeah. Um... Uh, it actually okay. tells you the line that has the issue, so double click on it. It's 26, okay, so I think. Run. Right. Okay. And it says 26. So let's go to line 26 on the script. Let's look at it. Line 26. So this, so what is going on is, um, here at the top of your script, you have a few things that run automatically. But as soon as you reach this line, let me see, this is a comment right here. As soon as you reach this line right here, it stops executing other things. So if you want this to get executed right away, you have to put it at the top of your script. You cannot put it at the bottom. So you would have to put it up here. And I don't know if you're noticing that you have duplicate stuff here. You have the warn, you have the single instance. Those, all of those things, you already have them, so you don't need them. Feel and, free to delete, yes. Yeah. So now, now if we go ahead and run this script, and can run it from here by clicking the play button. Let me go ahead and see. Um, quick question, are you using AutoHotKey version 2? I don't know. <laughs> oh, no, 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 it, it, no, no, it's okay. So the thing is that you have the warn um, directive up here and that gives you warnings when you are not setting some variables and stuff like that. So let's comment it out for now. Let's see if the script actually runs. Did and you, it looks, maybe I wasn't listening to the time, but did you explain the auto execute section? I did, when I, well, when I was talking to, to Guy, I actually talked a little bit about it, um, but I didn't go into too much detail about it. I put a but, link in both chats. Yeah. It's something for you to understand, Ray. If you have that, that right. first return, or right. exit, or a hot string, or hot key, or whatever. Like that's your auto exec section. Yeah, it's kind so, of when you first get used to auto hotkey, it is weird. It takes you a little bit of understanding of like, hey, why why is something up here work and something down here doesn't work? And it's right. because it never gets there. And then, so I will I will later on talk a little bit about that. But let's go ahead and see. Uh, does that answer your question right here? I, I see that the script is actually running now. So it's down here. Okay. Right? Yeah. So now that um, should have set, got the vol volume and should have actually uh, shown something. So let's go ahead and restart, uh, restart the script and see if that happens. Because it should say kind of like a tool tip. Uh, well, the thing is, I kept getting error messages here. Uh, I copied this in. I kept getting error messages, so it just commented them out. Uh, oh, so. okay. So these traded things uh, are not actually um, spring. So you are getting an error. 
So you comment on the amount. So um, e even I think the 38 set batch lines negative one. 38. Here, I'll I'll, I'll oh, try this one here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Oh, but that's that's yeah. The thing is, yeah, that's part of the problem because it's not three B. It should be set batch line something but, in copy or copy there. But also. Uh, the, there's curly quotes instead of the oh, right here. Quote. I see um, yeah. which which are it's painful because word you know will add these curly quotes to make it look or smart quotes. Right, yeah, you know, and uh, yeah, it it messes up things. Right, what? there's a lot of curly quotes in here. Um, there they are. All so they're not actually quotes. Is the right. So that's the, and, and that's the issue. You need real, real quotes, the normal quotes, but for some reason. Uh, well, for me, typically when I copy right. stuff from where I paste it into Word, it'll uh -huh. wobble until you bring them in. Right. right. In Word, you can go turn off your smart quotes, and, and it, then it doesn't do that. Right. Now let's go ahead and verify some. Um, if you have this, you get some guess. Let's go ahead and message box these guys and see. I'm not getting any trade type, no trade things going on. I should get a. So I did get a bobby. That's good. I, I did get a bobby. This is what you break to. Okay. This looks okay. Oh, okay, hold on, give me a second. I'm right. I put my mouse over at prison. So I can change the icon. It is changing the icon. Here it is. So yeah, this will be find it. Oh, there you go. So when I put the mouse on top of it, Actually tells me what the of the the volume is. Tells that the volume is thirty one. And hopefully if you press left uh, hold left arrow and hold left there they are. Yeah, so it should actually set the volume for you. And basically the menu tray icon was changed to something else. So when I run this, the icon is this one. Yeah, there it is. The, the one with the headsets, like a little headset. Hey, <laughs> is um, yes. Let me uh, just for fun, and just just you you are you having control of this? I got forgot. Yes, I have control of this. In the chat, I put the there's an if um, in the if documentation. Right. There's a script which I use all the time. When you when you mouse over your taskbar and scroll up and down, it adjusts your volume. I, it's one okay. I love. Um, can you open a web page, please? So I'm not saying you have to use this right, but it's it something you might like. Right. Let's go ahead and double check that. Thank you. Thank you. While you're playing with that, guys, can I just um, make a little comment? Uh, by the sounds of it, you're trying to change the volume control of each app, one app at a time, um, which is awesome as an auto hotkey exercise. Um, there is something called Air Trumpet, which is you can download it for free from the Microsoft Store, and it does all that for you already. Um, so just you know, bear in mind Air Trumpet from the Microsoft Store. Yeah, I think I got that, but it didn't give me control by the keyboard, and I try to okay. use the keyboard as much as possible. Okay. Rather than the fiddly mouse. Okay. <laughs> um, Joe, I am not seeing. That's weird. They must have changed it because that's where I got it from. Yeah. Right. It might. Okay. It might be that they put it in a different page, like for example, the. the, the... It's short code. Let me just paste it. <laughs> Um, and I have a video I posted um, in, in some chat somewhere. I don't know. But I'll put it in the Zoom. It's very short 
Okay, so with Ear Trumpet, if you click on the um, on the on the actual slider, you can use the uh, left and right arrows. Uh, you can use up and down arrows to change sliders, and the left and right keys to change the volume on the slider. I'll, I'll look at that a little more. I wasn't aware of that. Oh, no. oh, so, oh I know um, what you mean. Let's see if you can go and open up the, the script that Joe sent um, on the chat, and uh, we just give it a take it take a look at it and just let us know if that actually works. Let's see if there's any questions in the meantime. Here's the chat. Yeah, actually, someone wrote me with a question that I wanted to... I had a quick one, too, after you. Oh, go for it, Tom. Oh, okay. Uh, it's just a simple one. I'll share my screen here real quick. Uh, so I stopped. Okay, there you go. Thank you. Oh, there you good. Uh, all right, you can see my screen? Okay, so the guy was just asking... Um... Hold on. Why is my computer doing this? Oh, there we go. <laughs> he was just asking, like, how to use a um, a variable, like a global variable inside of a function. So basically what we could do is, you know, let's create our variable. Let me move my mic here. I can't see my keyboard. Uh, where was I? Yeah, this is V1. Um, so we'll just call our function function. And so even though I had the variable up here, you know, we needed to find it as a global. So we just type basically global and then the name of our variable, which is just variable. Obviously, you would rename it to whatever you want. And then we could just have like a message box that says um, our variable name. And that's pretty much it. You have to put quotation marks on the logo. Um, oh yeah right 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 yeah. so yeah um so this yeah we just all we really do is in front of it make sure there's a space in between your name of your variable and global um so you can do that so hopefully that answered your question good thing about that you can actually add several variables there separated by commas so you can actually say bar one comma bar two comma bar three and that way you were defining them all as global yeah all at once and the Zayas remind me of that, or both either of you guys, if you don't mention one, all variables are global. Is that right? That is correct. So if you go ahead and say global by itself, you do not put bar. In oh. there, you're making the whole function global, and all the variables that are inside, inside. the function are global. Oh, right. wow. Nice to know. Good shortcut. Right. Yeah. That is, that is actually something that happens. And... Um, I usually wouldn't recommend this, but depending yeah. on what you're doing, <laughs> yeah, it's simple. Yeah. If it's simple. Yeah. <laughs> let, let, let me show you what, what it, so again, it doesn't matter if you're doing very small scripts and you're not really debugging, right? Where it becomes a little bit of an issue is when you're debugging especially large programs because large programs might include a lot of global variables. So when you're debugging, it is going to be very difficult for you to see your variables. And uh, this is a little bit more advanced, and I will later on just go ahead and uh, at some point we might talk about that in the automator, but that is something that you can do. But right now, uh, yeah, but both, these showing, will, like, both yeah. of them, if you run the code, can you run the code and let us see the, the result of that? Or... Yeah. Right, so we'll just go ahead and it should show two message boxes. Uh, You've got to call the function. Oh. Yeah, you have to call it. Yeah, so below bar one and two, you have to call the function. Or doesn't matter where it is. This function, the say function. Yep. Yeah. And just put the parentheses. Yep. Right. It's hard to see my keyboard with the mic in the way. <laughs> <laughs> but right now, it should just yeah. when you do it, give you two message boxes. And then you world. Hold. So and and, and uh, for those who are testing out of hockey version two and other kinds of things like that. What happens is that in AutoHockey version 2, you do not even have to define that um, because let's say you have variable, a little word, and you have function, just exactly what you said, function. Now, down here, I could just message box bar, and AutoHockey version 2 has access to all the 
um, all the global variables by default. So inside a function, you can refer to global variables without having to define them. Um, and that is something interesting, but you cannot set a value to it. If you set a value to it, it's not gonna work, right? It doesn't work because it's not the global variable. But if you want to be able to modify global variables, then yeah, you have to do the same as before, global bar. Or a by now when you now when you modify it, modify it. If you want to do a quick biref example while you have that? By ref. Um yes. So I would have a uh, bar here, and now I could do this and outside. So in Arhati version two, you have this ampersand sign for being the by ref. Um, and now if I just make the function change the bar, the, the reference to it, um, it should actually let me see two parameters because this is the first bar. Ah, uh, yeah, um, this is a string. I have to pass it as a variable. There you go. So what happens is now. I just created a variable and I'm passing it by reference. My function takes a reference and whenever I modify information about it, I'm actually modifying the variable outside and it would actually show it. In Autohark version one, you can do the same. So you can do in Autohark version one, you have your bar, but you just pass the bar like this and here you could say by ref. So this is defining that that variable that you're passing is something that comes from outside the function. And whenever you modify it, it will modify whatever is outside the function. Too. So this would actually do the same thing. As yeah, some people new do the functions that um, want to return more than one value. This is what they'll resort to. Uh, I just personally like to just say, let me just create an object and return the object, and I can unpack it however I want and not. Right. Now, um, and this is the other thing, there is a reason why you might want to do by ref. So say, for example, um, that, that you have to understand what is going on. So let, 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 me, let me do this. This, this is a very simple thing. So I have a parameter, right? So my function takes a parameter. Message box, parameter. Now, when you pass a variable like this, you are making a copy of that variable. You're making a different copy. And when you message box that here, what you're looking at is at the copy of the variable, not the variable itself. What that means is, say for example, that your function is going to grab a very large text and you want to modify it instead of making two copies of the same text, you can just go ahead and say by ref, and you just work with one copy. And that makes your script a little bit more efficient. That's the reason why you might want to do this instead of just you know, copying uh, parameters and stuff like that. So that's the reason why you might want to go ahead and use by refs. You're working with variables that are really big. That's all. So, yeah, thank you, Isaiah. So someone wrote me, and I'm not going to go through their whole script because they, they wrote me and basically said, hey, they're doing some web scraping, and they're trying to download, I think they said 100 images, um, and and they're basically sending keystrokes and, and having some sleeps and waiting for the files to show up, and sometimes the send command is sending, you know, the wrong things, um, and they're asking how to, what are they doing wrong? I'm like... That's you're doing wrong is you're using keystrokes, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> we, we've done a lot on web scraping, and, and we did. He actually asked, can you use UI automation to help? Oh, yes, you can. Go. It's just, it, it is a little, it, it has its pros and cons. We actually tried making a video yesterday on it, um, and there were a couple hiccups, which we just, I mean, we didn't get stuck on, but we, we decided, you know what, let's, let's redo the video later on, a little more concise. Um, but right. it's... Uh, it's, do you do you want to show it, Isaiah, or does, are there any other questions? Maybe you can show just a simple example, or no? Oh, oh, oh that of automating yeah. with, so, with... So here's the thing, and I saw Irfan join. UI automating. 
there's there's Refidium you could use. There's um, which sort of relies on the Selenium web driver, which you could use, which I would not do. And then the auto control, which Tom had mentioned to me, an extension for Chrome, you can use for automating your browser, and that's probably for Chrome. And that's what I would I would take one of those. The UI automation you can. Yeah, yeah. Um, we did have some parts of the automation that was, uh, if you want, well, I don't know how many, if there are any other questions, because the thing is that that is a very, yeah, it's, it's a little bit more complex topic, so yeah. if we don't want to take up the time for, for, for people who well, might have questions. If they don't, then I go ahead and show it. It's okay. Yeah. Oh, oh, sorry, Robert wrote a question in the, in the chat. Can you get okay. a script to wait for a web page to finish loading? That's, I don't know if that, you wrote that before we started talking on this, Robert, or maybe it was because of it. I didn't, uh, yeah. sorry. So, but, yes, uh, yes, yes, yes. Um, yeah. The question is more like, should you, right? <laughs> with yeah, web yeah. browsers, here's the other thing, it's like, I, again, I'm going to, I'm going to sound like a broken record. I dream back in the days of automating with IE because it was so easy and so reliable and, and just, it was, it was so much easier. Um, Which, by the way, we have this news that probably the WebView 2 controller is out there, and right, right. that is kind of like basically the replacement for the yeah. IE automation. So I am you, having high hopes that. <laughs> if you get the newsletter, in one of the things of the things I said we're reading, I'm pretty sure that was one of the stories I put in there this week, was the WebView 2. It's available to Windows 11 right now, but they're going to backport it to Windows 10. And it's, it's hopefully, as they is saying, it's going to be kind of like a comm object that we can connect to and automate. Uh, having said that, the, you know, Refidium and, and Irfan's on here, we've done several uh, videos on Refidium, can, is, is pretty straightforward. But actually, I was going to jump back a bit to the guy that wrote me this thing that was asking about, he's sending keystrokes, can UI automation help? Here's, here's the conundrum, right, to me. The fact that he is sending keystrokes to me He's the biggest issue, yes. Right. However, it also, to some degree, indicates the level of sophistication of the person is at a program, right? To some degree. And someone who's sending keystrokes probably isn't ready to dive into a class using this complex stuff. Is the Here's the conundrum, right? Of That's the problem. Yeah, and, and, yeah. and, and uh, yeah, the UI automation tool, that particular... Uh, object this and an object that is present in Windows that um, object. then we in Arohaki are used to working in a in a specific way because Arohaki manages everything for you. You don't have to manage memory, you don't have to manage state, you don't have to yeah. <laughs> those classes which are based on Windows thing, they do not manage anything for you. You have to manage everything. That's the reason why GDI Plus is, so, is a library that is not used by everybody, because it's a little bit complex to use. Well, the UI automation tool is also one of those classes that there's a lot of things that you have to manually do, and for that reason, you have to do it, know exactly what you're doing. Um, if you don't know what you're doing, then it would be a little bit more complex to follow along. Now, for those of you who know how to use uh, uh, UIA in general or have a, a general idea, it's a great thing because you know what is happening, you know what to expect. But for example, uh, just to make a very basic example, we were doing this that we grab the handle of a window and try to get all the controls on it. Well, when the windows is minimized, the window doesn't have any control. You have to know that because whenever you minimize a window, Internally, Windows is just going to go ahead and take all the controls and take them out to save memory. That's what is going on. If you don't know that, your script is going to break and you're going to say, like, what is going on? You're not going to know what the heck is going on. You're going to spend way too much time trying to figure out something that is uh, for somebody who programs in C++ or something like that, it's basic knowledge. For us in our hot case, not really basic knowledge, but we don't have to care about it, right? <laughs> so, yeah. So Ray had another question. Um, okay, so uh, Control R doesn't run this. It used to. Well, the D, right? What's that D? Uh, oh, that, that I was wondering about that. That I guess a random artifact. <laughs> uh, if you save it and run it now, it should work. Uh, okay, so save, run. 
Uh, uh, no, uh, I I used to get a message box. No, no. right. Saying that reload works. I know. Um, hold on. Is it running? That's the first question. I think it is. Let's make sure, let's make sure that it's running first. Yeah, exit out of it and then. Is that the auto hotkeys? Yeah, that's auto hotkeys. Yeah. Does it need persistence on it or anything like that? With the hotkeys, you don't need the. There it goes. So it was the D? Yeah, the, that the because the thing is that if you have if you have um, when you're having a hot key right here, if you have anything right next to it, it will try to execute that. If you want to execute whatever is below, you cannot have anything right there at all. Okay. So it, it, it had something to do with that being there. Um, but but by the way, and, and unless I'm misremembering here, line thirty-seven. Not that it matters, but you have reloaded work. But you're not reloading. In, no, but it's in quotes. Yeah, yeah. and to your point, Isaiah's. Yeah, it's the reload is oh because oh, at the bottom line, right here, thirty nine. Yeah, you're you're just you're just letting yourself because the second you reload, of course, it's gone, and so you can't. can't <laughs> yeah, exactly. It so it has to it has to show it has to save the file, show the message box. Um, I don't know what Alt X does, probably close to, and then reload, and then it goes ahead. And goes. So, but I don't think you want the quotes around the reload works. Right? No, he doesn't need them no, yeah. because this is some that was again, now hotkey version one. Yeah. Right. In that command, in other command you might need. No, it hasn't. It hasn't. It hasn't. Let's click OK. Now try it again. Now, now you should see the real one. Yeah, there oh, I see. It was showing the quote. Oh, and yeah, exactly. Which doesn't really matter. It just it's just, it's just <laughs> to make it's it more of a learning better. thing for you to understand. You know, if you had an expression there, you'd want the quotes. But without yeah. the expression, you don't. Okay, but, thanks, guys. That, that, that saves me a lot of frustration. I just curly curly quotes. Okay. Right. Now, now I will watch for curry quotes. Okay. <laughs> but I think that, that has to do with me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A, a quick question, um, Joe, in the code that you published with the cards of volume up and the volume down, yeah. you're meant to put the mouse over the um, the tray icons on the right or on the left. It, it just moves the general volume, not the volume specific to the application. Is that correct? Yeah, it's just your overall volume. So if you use the mouse over any icon, it changes overall volume, nothing else. It, it's not the icons, it's your taskbar. See, Anywhere on your taskbar. See, like this. It's your yeah. master volume it's changing, right? Yeah, the master. Not, yeah, it's not, it's like, not like individual apps. Okay, I was thinking he was changing a specific, the volume just for that application. You know uh, what? That, that is a very interesting concept because you know that we have the volume mixer and we have that volume for each application. Yeah. It'll be interesting if you move the mouse, uh, the you know control mouse wheel. It would actually just control the volume of that particular on the window that is active at the moment. You know, so that would be really really nice if you had like a shortcut key you can press and then use the um, the wheel. Um, at the moment, Air Trumpet does it, but you, it's graphically done. You can't target. Right. You exactly. cannot target um, uh, each application with keystrokes. No, exactly. Guy, are you in the witness protection program? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if I move a bit further back, there yeah, we you go. Maybe have, you maybe have a little bit of light right there. Yeah, there you yeah go. my lighting is a bit rubbish over here. So, hello. <laughs> <laughs> you you mean your green screen light doesn't help you? <laughs> I don't have a green screen light. There's no green screen. Uh, it's just that my studio is, is a mess at the moment, so I just dropped a... Um, I just dropped a, a fake background. Yeah, you know? background. I took a picture when it's tidy. <laughs> oh, that's yeah. so you actually have your real room in green or uh, dropping it in. That's funny. That's a smart no, idea. It's that's it's actually really clever. At the moment, just a tidy version of it. Yeah, that, that's a that's a smart idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So in general, I think it is a. a it is a very uh, interesting concept about, for example, one of the person, uh, the one, I think it was Robert who was asking if we can wait for a specific web page. And here is the guy who created the fading. And with this tool, it's really simple because it has a function. You just navigate to a web page and then you say, wait uh, page load. 
and it would actually just go ahead and wait for it. So uh, I don't know if Irfan would like to just show it or if I could do it, it's okay. Because we, we do have an example of both that. Yeah, if you go to the URL over my head, you'll, you'll see several videos on our video. And, actually, uh, I am using Zoom right now. Uh, okay, no worries. So, so I could I could actually just show it um, instead, but actually we did have a, um, let me see if I can just open that. I mean, there's a huge, there's a huge um, learning curve between sending keystrokes and using a video. Uh, no, not really. No? Actually, not at all. No. Awesome. No, 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 no. It's actually uh, one of the things why I like it a little bit better than other approaches is that um, it is really easy to understand what is going on because the the um, ramp is real quick. Uh, I want to close over. We have eight minutes. Okay. Um, Is that better, Joe? Move the camera. I, just, I looked up and I was like, hey. what's that? What's that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, but I had I had an example uh, before with the uh, repeating itself, but it's easy that I don't have it there. But in general, it was very simple. It was just about including your medium. Uh, this thing here. Now. One complexity, though, it, it's a little complex, is if you want to use, if you're going to be logging into something, you probably want to use your profile, right? Right. And so for that, you do have to make sure that ex, yeah, every instance of Chrome of your browser is closed in order to leverage your profile. Or you can launch it with the profile in a shortcut and tell it right. to launch a specific profile. Right. So you just have to load the Chromium to the Rupedium driver, and you create a new session, which is just the name for creating a new page, basically. And now that you have the page, you can say navigate to, navigate to google.google.com, and then you just say page, wait, um, load, wait for load. That's it. So basically- uh, Actually, you don't want to to wait, uh, it, it will wait. Oh, right. So you don't even have to do that. But when you navigate, it just waits for it. Awesome. Yeah. So basically, for answering Robert's question, at least with this particular tool, if you download it and have it, you can create a new instance of the class, which is a Chrome thing. And once you have it, I'm sorry, this is CHR here. From the, from the object, you can just create a new page or new session is the same. The new session just opens up a new tab, and that you have it in an object. That object, then, you can just tell it to navigate somewhere, in this case, in Google, any website, and it would actually wait for it. And after you are there, you can do very complex stuff like accessing the DOM, accessing specific elements, and those kind of things. So you might want to take a look at it. Um, Joe put the URL there on the top. And uh, there's a lot of examples out there. So when you go to that page, um, they have a lot of examples that you can follow along. Test. Lovely. Lovely. Yeah. Um, Ray was just asking if you would, it's, I understand why you're asking Ray. It's a, if you put a shortcut to your auto hotkey file in the auto hotkey folder where auto hotkey is, will it automatically load the reference script and know, you know, you need to, if you want it to run with Windows, you need to put it in your, you know, a shortcut to it in your startup. Right. Or you can use, do you remember what it's called? A few more minutes. Or startup. Yep. You can pop exactly. it in the startup, registry. Startup thing. No, yeah, well, well we have a tool for that, yeah. Yep, you have. Um, yep. Let me show you startup. Yeah, I put it in the YouTube chat. I'll throw it over here, too. Just to stream, because I don't know why um, Microsoft made it more difficult now compared to in Windows 7, it was so, you know, and before it was so easy to add things to your startup. Yeah, it is true. I had a quick thing. Got five minutes, huh? Oh yeah, no, it's it's more of just answering the guy's person. Um, you know, this is a live support help. 
uh, kind of thing. So we're here kind of, you wrote script, maybe, you know, as you, if you're watching, you see like we're helping people, oh, we're stuck here. Uh, the guy just asked if we could write two scripts for him live. <laughs> <laughs> so no no we're not really here for that <laughs> no well i would say like you can but i cannot guarantee that it's going to work because the biggest issue with creating scripts is not writing them it's easy to write anything the yeah, problem yeah. is that to make it work because then you write it you try to run it and there's going to be something that doesn't work and you start debugging when you start but, debugging that's where the time goes <laughs> but to, to tom's point as well like yeah. we, we want to help people learn. We're not here right. just to, 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 to do the right. Right. something. Like cause... even if you have a question, you haven't even start your script. You know, like with the global function thing. Like yeah, I'll show you the function, but then you know we kind of hope you go from there with what we yeah. gave you, and then actually write your script. So this is more of a live help. If you want something more specific like that, you just need to email us, and we're not just gonna you know probably write for free. <laughs> we'll guide <Yeah>. you, <laughs> but. Well, that, and that's the point is to help educate people like, yeah I'm, we're volunteering our time education you know, channels but yeah we're not just freehand writing and there's your hero program as well isn't there right. joe yeah hey there you go thanks guy that's a good uh leeway well, into our last is human halfway house you know if you want joe to write everything for you you hire him as a script writer if you want joe <laughs> to help debug a script for you then you might want to go and, and use the 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 um the hero program. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, good so leeway. Know, Joe, if you found the script, the the one that we were looking at is the oh, yeah. at startup, right? Yeah, I I put it above me and in the chat. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I was not looking at the. the yeah. Thankfully, I have our tool we wrote in on a hotkey to go quickly look at all of our links and, and yeah. Make yeah, exactly. We did that. <laughs> no, that so yeah, um, in general, I think. Uh, it is good that we can answer these little questions and, and, yeah. and hopefully, you know, for the last two minutes, I could just go ahead and talk about the auto execute section of our hockey because that applies to everybody. Uh, it doesn't matter what level you're at. Uh, it is something very good to always understand and keep in mind. So whenever you start with a script, so you have a, an auto hockey script, you start with a section automatically, this is done automatically. It is called auto execute. And this section is going to run every single line that you have until it finds one of the following three things. Either a return. If it finds a return, it stops there. Or the same with a hot key if you have a hot key. Or if you have a hot string. Those three things would make the script stop right there. And that means that anything that is between this, the first line of your script and a return or hotkey or anything any any of those three things a hotkey a hot string or a return it will go ahead and do that automatically anything that is below that so if you have a hotkey anything that is below that is not going to get executed automatically okay and that's what the message was saying i think it was to ray also that it was saying like this line is never going to get executed because of the return. Yeah, because the auto execute section arrived to a hotkey because you had a hotkey there, and the message box was below the hotkey, so it was not an answer. So just keep that in mind whenever you're creating your scripts that there is a section that gets executed automatically, yeah, and the rest of it you have to pull it yourself. Is there really quickly, if I may, when you're putting hotkeys in, do you put them if you got multiple lines? Do you put a return at the end, or do you put curly brackets, or how do you wrap the hotkey with many lines? Um, just put them in a in a second line and add a return. Like, um, and and I think you have used it like that. So if you have a hotkey F1, yep. If it is a one liner, if it is just yeah, that's fine. But if it's here, multiple right, lines, let's say ten or fifteen you just lines, put it down and do yep. other things, and then put a return. And then put a return. Because okay. again, anything that is inside that is going to continue executing until it finds a return. What so about curly brackets? Um, yeah, you can add them if you want. To. That's not no, what I'm saying is it, you still have to have the return there, though. Yes. Well, for in version one, yes. In version two, no. But yeah. No, in version one. In version yeah. one. You have to do that. Yeah. You have to put the return. Put a return. Okay. It is as if it was a function. Okay. So um, I think it is already time for us to yeah, go to the other. Thanks, everyone. And
Thanks, everybody. See you next so thank Friday. You. Thank you. See you next Friday. Oh, they went ahead and closed it really fast. All right. Well, yeah, we're here every Friday, 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Obviously, convert to your time. And, uh, yeah, we're here to answer any kind of, you know, help, something you're stuck on, or maybe you just want to watch and learn something new. So we will see you next Friday. Peace out.